A very good afternoon to you all. It's, it's an enormous privilege um, to be here today. So, I farm in Wiltshire. Um, I normally say I farm near Salisbury in Wiltshire. But I've sort of stopped saying that because people tend to jump back. Um, and it has, I have to say, been quite an extraordinary thing to, to go through. I obviously drive through Salisbury quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, opened our eyes to a whole another world in a very sleepy part. Of, of the Wiltshire countryside. Um, but this is my farming business. Um, we are relatively small farmers. We are beef, sheep, and arable, and we are very diversified. So my background has been as much in catering as it has in agriculture. I've run a bespoke catering business for the past 25 years, and we run a wedding business as well. I was asked on the radio to the uh, other day, who's more difficult, farmers or brides? And I hadn't had a huge amount of time to think about it. And actually, it, it pays a lot of tribute to farmers, but it is brides. They are definitely much, much more difficult than, than farmers. But in my position as, as president of the NFU, and let's just hope the whole female price tag falls off pretty quickly. It's um, a little bit frustrating where men and women have been involved for millennia uh, in farming. Um, but I represent 55,000 farmers and growers across England and Wales. So this, this is an enormously important time. It is an absolutely pivotal time uh, in our history. I would describe it as the greatest challenge since the Second World War and potentially the greatest challenge in our entire 110 years. And just constantly remember, all of you, each and every one of you, as we travel through this conversation, that... Tim Breitmar, as president of the CLA, is here as well. You know, we are representing individual farming businesses. The UK is made up predominantly with actually small family farming businesses. So throughout these conversations, just remember there are real people, which I think is a great strength, that are managing 70% of the UK's uh, land mass. I like to use this slide because I think we're in danger at the present moment in time of thinking, my goodness, everything is a car crash. Everything is disastrous. We've got a huge amount to do. And the really good news is that actually it's not a car crash. It is really quite good. And I do feel we start Brexit with pretty solid foundations underneath us. And a lot of that has been covered off uh, this morning and just now, but we've come a very, very long way in the past 20 years. I think the last 20 years have been a game changer in food production, and now we have the opportunity to actually do it better. Um, so we are the largest manufacturing sector, currently worth uh, food, farming and drink, 112 billion to the UK economy. We are the most significant employer. We are employing one in eight people. But more than that, and it was only when talking to a member of the cabinet a few months back who said, you know, you can now bring all that land back into production now we're out of Europe. And I said, um, what land? Those strips around those fields. And I said, do you mean our grass margins? I said, that is 37,000 kilometres of grass margins that we have created over the last 20 years. And those are corridors for success. So for our brown hares, our wildlife, those grass margins are absolutely pivotal, should be enriched, cherished and maintained going forwards. We have planted 30,000 kilometres of hedgerow new hedgerow that's been planted. We are, Matt, uh, you as a Northumberland farmer, we are actively maintaining 2,700 kilometres of stone walls. So we do have a good story to tell, um, and we need to tell it. And we have to take some criticism here as farmers that we have not taken the countryside enough to the town. We have not explained enough about what we are doing, about what actually that CAP investment was doing and our journey over the last 20 years. And that conversation needs to start now, and that's why events like these are so hugely, hugely important. Um, Another slide on the environment, because I genuinely think of myself as an environmentalist and a farmer. And I think every farmer out there actually should think of themselves as an environmentalist and a farmer. Because our soils, whatever sector you are from, our soils are pivotal to our success. They are a difference between us having a good business and a bad business. They are the difference between having an unprofitable business and a profitable business. So we've got a third of all farmers now that have diversified into renewable energy. 
We are on the Government One Health strategy. We are hitting, we are actually well below the global target on AMR, on antibiotic usage. We are below the 50 mg per kilogram. There aren't many countries <coughs> right across the world that can say that. Um, we've halved, as Matt referred to, we've halved our use of pesticides in the last 20 years. We've halved our use of an inorganic fertiliser. Why have we done that? Because we've innovated, we've used tech, and we're targeting our approach. Now, that's in the farmer's interest, because obviously your inputs cost a huge amount of money. So the less you have to spend on inputs, the better, but it's also in the interests of the environment. And high-tech farming is what has allowed us to put more land aside for nature. I've never really quite understood the, the lack of dialogue between uh, rewilding and, and food production, because I have lots of, of wild places on my farm. Every farm has lots of wild places on it that we should be really shouting about what we're doing, because those wild spaces on our farms are hugely important but we haven't tended to talk about that. We've tended to say we are food producers and we've not talked about our world spaces and all the other things that I have said about the environment. But there are, I'm going to flip between optimistic and, and slightly pessimistic, that there are some big, big hurdles to overcome. And, and the biggest challenge the landscape faces, the biggest challenge the environment faces is getting the trade deal right. Now, trade is really boring, it is really dull, it is like doing a degree on top of the day job, so most people aren't even going to contemplate doing it. That's the challenge. Whereas if you talk about the environment, you talk about nature, you talk about wildlife, well, that's nice, and that's easy, and who wouldn't want to talk about that? No one's going to want to talk about trade. And therein lies the challenge, because getting the right trade deal is pivotal to each and every one of us. It is pivotal to each and every consumer out there. So we've had a, a good relationship on trade with the EU. We've been trading tax-free for over 40 years. 40% 40 of our lamb is going into the European Union. Now, there are many parts of the UK that do not have the diverse opportunities that I have farming in Wiltshire. There are many parts of the UK that only grow grass. And your only business option is to have beef and sheep in those places. So this underpins a culture and a heritage that has been going on for millennia. So it's really important that we understand it, just get to know it, understand it. We must bring the countryside to the town, we must all get out, and, and let's understand what is going on in rural Britain. 80% um, of our dairy products, uh, dairy exports, are going into the EU, and 75% of our wheat and barley is going into the EU. So it remains a critical market, 500 million consumers on our doorstep. Um, the biggest challenge, though, I talked about was trade. And what I mean by that is if we opened our doors to the rest of the world in, in the sort of, he's terribly intelligent, Jacob Rees-Mogg, but I do feel he's sort of maybe 100, maybe 200 years um, born too late. Um, but he talks about cheap food. He talks about cheaper clothes. He talks about cheaper shoes. You know, that, that is the challenge. We must have our standards embedded into every trade negotiation. Um, so that they are respected. Because if we do, and history will tell us, only look at the repeal of the Corn Laws to look at what happened uh, last time we opened the floodgates and said, we're a wealthy nation, we'll import the food. Look at the history lessons we've learned. Um, just a, a couple of things here, because these are all absolutely crucial. Um, regulation. Um, I think you know we tend to not really look at the costs of regulation. Um, we tend to talk about chlorinated chicken. Chlorinated chicken is not the issue here. It is the method of production. So we are chlorinating uh, the chicken in the US because we are not cleaning out in between flocks coming in. So in the UK, you cannot have another flock come in unless you are cleaning it all out. Um, we have very, very high levels of regulation, which they don't have in other parts of the world, which is why you have to chlorinate wash. So it's not about the chlorination. It's about the method of production. And also the cost of regulation. Now, I've just put up a, a building at home for housing our cattle in the winter. I had to go through not just planning, but an environmental impact assessment and various other hoops. And that's fine. And I absolutely agree with that. But if you want to put, say, a poultry shed up in Brazil, you don't have to do any of that. You can put a state-of-the-art poultry shed up uh, for 18,000 in Brazil. Well, I didn't even get through my environmental impact assessment for that. So we need to factor that in. And that's what's going to lead me on to this next slide, 
which is about how we do have a new vision for what an agricultural policy is going to look like. And I apologise for the Venn diagram. We started life in the NFU with a lovely, beautiful house and a whole farmed approach. And then, as all lovely policy people do, they get into Venn diagrams. I thought the house was beautiful, and I had a conversation with the Swiss government. And I uh, was talking them through this and the journey of the house, the diagrams, the arrows. And she said, oh, right, OK, well, we start with the house. Um, so maybe we'll go back to the house. But what this explains is a three-legged stool. It's, it's a third, a third, a third of investment. So yes, we've got an opportunity to do what we do for the environment differently. We've got a chance to invest in it. But we're only going to achieve on that if we actually focus on new productivity measures. Productivity is the most misunderstood word in the English language, as far as I'm concerned. I can see Sean at the back there. I can remember having to explain it to the National Trust. No, it does not mean randomly producing more. It is about actually an innovative approach. It is about producing more because you are impacting less. You are tech focused, you are innovating, you are causing less damage. So because of that, you are producing more. But seemingly, it has to be explained a lot. But it's a very, very uh, important word for the future. And volatility, you know, why do countries right across the world support agriculture? Why do they do it? Because they all want to keep food affordable. You know, if you want to have a crisis in society, you have food prices rising out of control, or worse still, you have food shortages. We are supposedly only ever five meals away from riots, and that's why agriculture is often supported in many, many different ways. What we are saying is this has to be about food production and this has to be about the environment, and we have to do them both together. Now... Um, who thinks, hands up, who thinks we take food for granted? Come on, be bold. We all do. So the ones that haven't got their hands up, we all take food for granted. 24-7, we have access to it. We never question it. Um, I'm sadly old enough that I remember the last time we got snowed in. I remember the last time we ran out of bread. I remember the last time we didn't have any milk. Now, the bulk of my village, when we had all that snow, a lot of them, as you can imagine, are under 30. So they'd never experienced that. They never had a time when they didn't have milk, they didn't have bread. And my local co-op store had a near riot going on as to why they could not get milk and bread into the store. And the poor store manager was having to explain, you've got to understand that the roads are covered in snow, we cannot get lorries into the depot, we cannot get lorries out of the depot. But my goodness, was it a wake-up call? You know, something that we take for granted so much. Food availability. Um, in this very volatile world, you've got North Korea on one side. You've got what is going on in my hometown, which we won't mention. And you've got President Trump. You've got a very volatile world out there. And we have 65 million people to feed. So food security is going to matter going forwards. And a level of self-sufficiency is going to matter as well. So we pride ourselves in the NFU, actually, that we do want consumers to sort out of a global food larder. And again, you're probably still wondering, well, why has she got a picture of a foreign tractor up there? I've put the picture of the foreign tractor up there because it's the red tractor. It is the mark of honesty uh, throughout our supply chain. Um, so many people will recognize it on PAC. Um, how many people actually understand what it means? Very few. 57% of consumers recognize it. Um, probably about 10% actually understand what it means. So it's a mark of honesty. It means that that supply chain has been independently ordered. So from my farm, through the processing and the packing to when it sits on the shelf. So the consumer, when they buy it, knows actually what standards they are buying. And we are incredibly lucky as consumers in this country that we have a plethora of assurance schemes from LEAF to RSPCA to Soil Association. So the consumer can shop to their budget. But I'm going to leave you with one final message, and that is, while we're having this conversation, we still have children going to bed hungry in London. We have an austerity crisis going on at this moment. We have a lot of people struggling to make ends meet, and we are living with the most globally unique retail price war. So making sure that we do not have an agricultural policy for the privileged few 
to quote Theresa May, has never been more important. This has got to be a policy that is available to everybody on every income. We must not disadvantage people um, from being able to buy British food and being able to have our farmers and growers hitting every single price point. Um, I think that, for me, is hugely important. That, for the people I represent, is hugely important. But much more than that, for consumers out there, it is really important that they all have access to British food. And if we get everything that I've said right, we can achieve this, a green Brexit. Thank you.